lecture number nine. We shall begin at slide 91, and this will be the final lecture of the book of Ezra, describing the coming of Ezra to Jerusalem. As preparation for these last few chapters, it's important to realize that with the building of the temple and the reinstatement of sacrifice, this progress did not automatically uh, guarantee that the people would be faithful to the covenant. In fact, in their previous history during the monarchy, they had had the temple and they had maintained the temple rituals, but they still had fallen into syncretism and idolatry following the religions of the Canaanites and the practices of the Mesopotamians. And it is for this that they lost the land and the first temple had been destroyed. So the idea of a renewal of the covenant, which was more than just the ceremony of the temple, but was actually a renewal of their hearts before God, was extremely important. God's command to them from the very beginning, all the way back in the time of Moses, is that they should love the Lord their God with all their heart and with all their soul and all their mind and all their strength. And the temple and the ceremonies associated with the temple uh, was a way of expressing that devotion, but it was not something that could be done simply as ceremony alone. There had to be something deep within them responding to their God, their covenant God, that would make the relationship a real entity. And so the coming of Ezra was extremely important because the coming of Ezra is, in fact, uh, the time when the covenant is actually renewed and the people begin to uh, embrace the covenant as part of their everyday lifestyle. Slide 92. The coming of Ezra is about a half a century later than the completion of the temple. As you begin chapter 7 of Ezra, it simply says, after these things, uh, or after this. Um, But that first phrase in chapter 7 and verse 1 uh, doesn't uh, tell you exactly how long it was. But in fact, as we will see, because of the people involved in the uh, the chronology that can be established based upon Persian kings, that this was more than half a century later since the completion of the temple. Given that it was this much later, uh, the temple being completed in 516, and now we are already up into the seventh regnal year of Artaxerxes I, Artaxerxes Longimanus, uh, this is going to bring us down to the year 458 B.C. Well, a lot can happen in 50 years, and by this time we should assume that the early leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua, uh, plus the preachers Haggai and Zechariah, probably are now gone. Presumably they have died in the meantime, at least there is no further mention of any of these four names in the rest of the book of Ezra. So we should assume that Zerubbabel, the governor, Joshua, the high priest, and Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets, uh, have died one by one. Now there are not the same kind of leaders in the community that are left. Also, if the uh, sermons of Malachi are an indication, and usually scholars take the book of Malachi to be in about the same period of time, usually about 450 B.C., maybe just slightly later, But if those oracles are any indication of the temperament and the disposition of the people, then the community of Israel in Jerusalem had really fallen into a state of of deep spiritual despair, a lot of disillusionment, a lot of cynicism and hostility toward God. In fact, if you look at the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi uh, has within it a set of dialogues uh, between the people and God. Now, whether the people were actually saying these things out loud is perhaps uh, a question. This may simply be a literary form that Malachi uses to describe their mindset. But nonetheless, whether they said these things out loud or not, they certainly were saying these kinds of things in their heart. God says to the people, I've loved you. And cynically they ask, how have you loved us? God says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. And if I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me? But the people ask, how have we despised your name? Again, that that very cynical, hostile answer. Later, uh, 
uh, God will say that Judah has broken faith by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. Now, this is really probably a statement about the fact that they were marrying the daughters of foreign locals who were worshiping foreign gods. But in this, in essence, the the uh, idea is the same. And then later, of course, uh, 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 Malachi reprimands them for uh, reprimands them for breaking covenant with their marriage partners, whom they have married when they were young, and now they're putting away their wives and taking on younger wives from the locals that surround Jerusalem rather than from the people of Israel themselves. And so as you work your way through Malachi, which we're not doing at this point, but you will see that there was a, a, an incredible amount of hostility toward God, a lot of cynicism, a lot of disillusionment, uh, and things were at a very deep spiritual low at the time that Ezra is finally going to come and try to renew the covenant with the people. Slide 93. Ezra was a priest. And in fact, the first several verses of chapter 7 will give us his pedigree, tracing his lineage all the way back to Aaron, the brother of Moses, the first of the high priests that were designated by God. Ezra had gained permission to lead another group from Babylon. It would take them four months, actually, to make this trek from the city of Babylon back to the city of Jerusalem. And that uh, trek is summarized very briefly in verses 6 through 9. Uh, Ezra takes with him uh, some of the Israelites. He has both priests and Levites and singers and gatekeepers and temple servants, all kinds of people who will be important for the maintenance of the temple. And he arrives in Jerusalem in the seventh year of the king, in the fifth month, uh, after having left on the first day um, of the first month. And so it was basically a four-month trip. And it says, especially in verse 10 of chapter 7, that Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the Torah of Yahweh and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. This also is an important idea because it exemplifies one of the uh, uh, tasks of the priesthood. Usually when we think of priesthood, we often think of the ceremonial aspects of offering sacrifice and uh, maintaining the table of uh, bread in the sanctuary and the lighting of the candelabra and all of those kinds of ceremonial things that happen at the great festivals. But there was another very important task of the priests, and that was to be teachers of the Torah to the people. You have to remember that in the earliest days, probably most of the people were not readers. Uh, and even if they could read, they would not have owned their own copy of the Torah. Hearing the Torah and understanding what it what, what was written in it was uh, really up to the priest to verbally teach and explain the Torah to the people at various intervals, especially at the great festivals that happened every year. The uh, prophets sometimes condemned the priests because they were not good teachers and they were not faithful teaching priests. But Ezra exemplifies the ideal of the teaching priest. He not only is coming to Jerusalem to participate in the temple rituals, but he is coming to Jerusalem to devote himself to the study and the observance of the Torah, to teaching the decrees and the and the laws of the Torah to the people. And so his uh, arrival in Jerusalem was very, very important. And he came not only as the leader of a returning group, but he also had an official letter of authority from Artaxerxes I that gave him permission to do what he wanted. This letter is reproduced in chapter 7. And again, this is one of the places in Ezra where the language changes from Hebrew to Aramaic, for the letter is the letter in Aramaic, which is the official language of correspondence. In this official letter, Ezra was granted permission to take as many with him as wanted to accompany him from Babylon to Jerusalem. And so there was quite a number that agreed to do that. He was also given a state grant for sacrifices, which was certainly uh, a welcome thing. Uh, In verse 15, it says, uh, Moreover, you are to take with you the silver and gold that the king and his advisors have freely given to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. So they were able to take with them uh, quite a considerable uh, 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 group of funds that would would assist in in, uh, the renewal of the covenant. 
Uh, they also carried with them uh, a commission to the governor of the Trans-Euphrates province that he was supposed to supply them with materials uh, to assist them in the observances of the temple and the post-exilic community. And once again, especially for the governor of the Trans-Euphrates, who was not very favorable toward Jerusalem or the Jews in Jerusalem, this must have come as, as, a, as a very unwelcome communication. Not to mention the fact that the the writ from uh, Artaxerxes mentioned that the Jews would be exempt from taxes. Uh, so suddenly, uh, the Trans-Euphrates province is going to be uh, required to provide supplies for the Jews, and at the same time, they are not going to be able to to uh, receive taxes from the Jews because they had received an exemption. The final thing, uh, which is described right near the end of the chapter, is that Ezra was able to set up a judicial system and to appoint civil magistrates for the enforcing of the laws of Torah. Now, many of the laws of Torah, of course, were civil laws that had to do with the way you lived in ordinary life. Um, And even though uh, uh, Judea and Jerusalem were in the province of the Trans-Euphrates, and even though that was part of the larger Persian Empire, the Jews were allowed to set up their own judicial system. That was important because the laws of Moses would not have been well known by Persian magistrates. How would a Persian magistrate be able to arbitrate a situation that was uh, supposedly regulated by a passage in Leviticus, say, or perhaps the book of Deuteronomy? It would take someone from the Jewish community to be able to do that. And so the authorities set up a judicial system and to appoint civil magistrates to enforce that judicial system was very, very important for the coming of Ezra. Slide 94. This is a bas-relief of Artaxerxes I, Longimanus. This is the emperor, the Persian emperor, who gave permission for Ezra to return. Uh, as you can see, uh, and we've already seen bas-reliefs that are similar to this in, in previous lectures, you can see that Artaxerxes is depicted in the traditional, stereotypical way of Persian monarchs. He is sitting on a rather elaborate throne, and his feet are resting upon a footstool, and he holds in his hand the scepter or staff of his authority. In this case, there is a servant behind him who is wielding a fly whisk. Uh, Of course, we must keep flies off of the royal personage, and so sometimes in these kinds of depictions you will see servants uh, wielding fly whisks like this uh, as a a level of comfort uh, and honor for the Persian monarch. This particular one is from the administrative center in Persepolis and from the Hall of a Hundred Columns, uh, which is one of the major excavations of ancient Persia. Slide 95. In chapter 7 and 8, several times you will find this same phrase, the gracious hand of our God was upon us. Certainly, in the return of Ezra to Jerusalem, and in all of the events that accompanied and surrounded that return, Ezra saw that God was leading him. God had his hand upon him, and God was preparing the way before him. And so repeatedly he says this, the gracious hand of our God was upon us. Slide 96. Once you get into chapter 8, you will find the details of Ezra's organizing of the group that was going to return. There are lists of family heads and people who came up from Babylon uh, during the reign of Artaxerxes, this second great wave of immigrants coming from Babylon back to Jerusalem. One of the things you'll notice, especially if you compare the lists of names in chapter 8 with the lists of names back in chapter 2 of Ezra, and then in turn, if you have access to the apocryphal book of 1st Esdras, and you look at the list of names that is provided there in chapter 8, you'll discover that many of these family names are virtually identical. This means that the initial returning group, which came with Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel, and then the second major group that came with Ezra, are going to be largely from the same families. The family names illustrate that they are linked with each other. This is probably not too surprising, because those who were still in Babylon would naturally uh, want to connect with their relatives, which already were in Jerusalem. And it's very possible that there were correspondences between them. We certainly know that uh, it was possible to correspond even over long distances uh, 
uh, between people groups of this type. So there probably was a lot of encouragement by the people who were in Jerusalem, encouraging their fellow family members who still were in Babylon that they should come and join the remnant who were now uh, established in Jerusalem. When Ezra had, a, had, had assembled the group uh, and was preparing to leave, he discovered, to his chagrin, that there were no Levites present in the group. He had assembled them at a canal in Babylon called the Ahava, and as they had camped there, he went through the list of names and checked among the people and the priests, and he found, we don't have any Levites. And so this was cause for great concern, because the Levites were quite important uh, in the administration of the temple. So Ezra decided it was important to take some extra time and to recruit some Levites. So in verses 16 through 20 of chapter 8, you find his efforts of recruiting Levites, and eventually, uh, altogether, there were more than 200 volunteers who responded to also join the group that was going to return from Babylon to Jerusalem. Also, you should remember that travel in the ancient world was uh, dangerous, uh, particularly a trek as long as this one, which was a four-month trek. Uh, they would be traveling uh, in areas that might have some cities, but they would also be traveling in areas that was not well protected. And so as a sign of trust in God, Ezra decided not to ask for a military escort. Typically, he would have had uh, a military escort of cavalry, uh, some kind of Persian uh, military detachment, uh, but he decided that in view of his trust in God, he would not ask for that, but he would trust that God would take care of them along this long journey. And in fact, that is exactly what happened. They finally arrived in Jerusalem after a successful trip. And uh, when they arrived, they rested for three days. So they left Babylon from the Ahava Canal. The hand of God was on them. God protected them from enemies and from bandits along the way. And they finally arrived in Jerusalem and they rested for three days. Finally, on the fourth day, they were able to weigh out the various gifts of money and coinage that had been given them as supplies for the temple in Jerusalem. And after this successful trip, they offered sacrifices of thanksgiving to God in the temple in Jerusalem. Slide 97. As Ezra arrived in Jerusalem and kind of got his bearings, he began his teaching ministry to the people who were there. In chapter 7, and verse 10, of course, we looked at that verse a moment ago, but let's look at it again, because it says, Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the Torah of Yahweh and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. As Ezra began his teaching ministry, there was a deep moral response from the people. They realized immediately that in many ways they had not been keeping the covenant that God had made with their ancestors. And this was cause for great concern and great alarm. Had not it been for this very reason that their ancestors had been driven out of Israel and taken as captives to Babylon in the first place? And so there was great concern on the part of the people, and especially at issue was the Torah's requirements for racial purity in marriage. Back in the book of Exodus, as well as in the book of Deuteronomy, the Israelites were strictly forbidden to intermarry with the pagan Canaanites of the land of Canaan. Now, of course, the people coming back from Babylon are coming back in a similar situation, except that they are coming back to Israel from the east rather than from Egypt. But nonetheless, many of them had already racially intermarried with locals, people who did not worship Yahweh and who were not followers of the Torah. Now, you do need, do need to understand that this wasn't just simply an ethnic issue. This was essentially a religious issue. The Israelites, actually, and the, and the law of Moses, allowed for proselyte marriage. People who embraced the faith of Israel were allowed to marry Israelites. In fact, when the Israelites first came out of Egypt, you may remember that there was a large mixed multitude who came with them. But this mixed multitude embraced the Torah. They embraced the worship of Yahweh. And so by doing so, they became proselyte Israelites. You also may remember the little story of Ruth. Ruth was not an Israelite. She was a Moabite. But nonetheless, because of her sworn oath to be faithful to Yahweh, she became a proselyte Israelite. 
So when the Israelites came back then to the land of Israel from Babylon, this remnant of Judah, but they married or intermarried with people from the local uh, population, the issue wasn't simply racial. The issue was essentially religious. For these people whom they married were not worshipers of Yahweh. And they, of course, would therefore not train their children to be worshipers of Yahweh. So <clears throat> Ezra decides that there needs to be a real coming to terms with this issue. And the initial response comes from the community leaders who reported that the people, the priests and the Levites, all of them had participated in this sin of intermarriage. It wasn't just restricted to a few. This seemed to be generally the way things were being done. And so uh, if Malachi's oracles addressing the situation are relevant, and they, they seem to be, and we read a couple of those passages a, a bit ago, then some of the Jewish men had actually divorced their own wives to marry non-Jewish women. Notice especially what Malachi says in chapter 2 and verse 11. He says, Judah has broken faith. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary Yahweh loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. You see, rebuilding the temple was not enough. It was certainly the first step, but it certainly was not the last step. There had to be a keeping of the covenant. And, as this text says in Malachi, as for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may Yahweh cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to Yahweh Savaot. You flood Yahweh's altar with tears and you weep and wail. but He no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them. And you ask, why? It's because Yahweh is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth. In other words, Yahweh is acting as the witness between you and the young woman that you married first. And you've broken faith, even though she's your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. And so, in divorcing your wife and adding to your family young women of local families who were not Israelites, you are compromising the faith of Israel. This is what Malachi is saying. And so, this situation, which seems to be very much the same as we're talking about in the book of Ezra, was deeply, deeply distressing to Ezra. As Ezra confronts this, he realizes that as a priest, he must accept solidarity with his own people. For this, in fact, is the very essence of being a priest. In fact, you'll find this very idea carries right into the New Testament. The idea that a priest must be sympathetic with the sins of the people. And so Ezra decides that the thing that he must do is he must confess the sins of the people as their priest. And so in the middle of chapter 9, you find that in verse 5, at the evening sacrifice, Ezra rose uh, with his tunic and t- a cloak torn, and he fell on his knees with his hands spread out to Yahweh, and he begins to pray a prayer of confession. One of the first things that should strike you about this prayer is that this prayer is in the first person plural. Repeatedly, Ezra prays from the standpoint of we, not just passing blame upon the people, but he takes his part as their priest, and he, in a sense, bears their sins in confessing them to God. We, our guilt, our sins, the sins of our priests, all of this is part of uh, of Ezra's confession. The violation endangers the entire community, and Ezra knows this very well. In fact, this idea of Ezra accepting solidarity with the people and taking their sins upon himself is such an important idea because it stretches all the way to the New Testament. In fact, in Jesus, who is the great high priest whom we as Christians serve, he also did that very same thing in that he accepted the sins of the people upon himself. And so he is, as the book of Hebrews describes him, a merciful and faithful high priest. Ezra is the same. He is a merciful and faithful high priest, accepting solidarity with the sins of his own people. And he realizes that uh, the sins of the people are endangering the entire community. In fact, in his prayer, he even envisions the possibility that the people of Israel might be uh, completely wiped out because of their sins. He says in verse 14 of chapter 9, Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices, that is, the sins against the Torah? 
Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? O Yahweh, God of Israel, you are righteous, and we are left this day as a remnant. And here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us can stand in your presence. Well, Ezra's public confession drew a crowd, because he does this right out in the open. People gather around and they listen to him, and they realize that he is praying for them. And one of the family leaders who had returned with Ezra encouraged Ezra, take the leadership, we must make amends for this. And so while Ezra is praying and confessing and weeping before God, this large crowd of men and women and children gather around him, and they also begin to weep bitterly because they realize the truth of what Ezra was saying. We've been unfaithful to God by this marriage of foreign women and accepting within our communities their foreign religions. In spite of this, however, there is still hope for Israel because we will repent and we will change our ways and we will renew our covenant with God and send away all of these women and their children. And so the advice given to Ezra was that we must do this, but let it be done according to the law. Now, to do this according to the law, of course, meant that they would have to write certificates of divorce. Back in Deuteronomy 24, there are the stipulations for writing certificates of divorce, which meant that these women would now be able to go back to their families uh, in the local communities that were non-Israelite, and they could marry again. In fact, that's what the certificate of divorce was about, was the permission actually to remarry. It uh, validated that they were no longer married to their first husband. And so a solemn public gathering was ordered, and they all gathered in front of the recently completed temple. Unfortunately, it was not a good season of the year because it had started to rain, and people were trying to do this in the rain. And so at Ezra's prompting, they agreed to divorce their foreign wives and to offer sacrifices for their sins, but they did ask for there to be a reprieve from the rain. This was getting to be a very difficult situation as they're standing around in the rain. And so Ezra agrees, and they uh, set up a system by which the various people could register in their towns uh, who had married foreign wives and certificates of divorce, according to the law of Moses, could have been written for them. And so that all was done just as the people requested. Slide 99. As we come to the end of the book of Ezra, we find that the last part of Ezra chapter 10 is a list of those who are guilty of intermarriage. The first list has to do with priests, and then there were uh, a list of Levites, and then there were a list of other Israelite leaders. And the very last verse of the book of Ezra says, All these had married foreign women, and some of them had children by these wives. Now, it must have been a pair of very painful circumstance to write certificates of divorce for all of these wives, and especially for their children. But because these wives were not worshipers of Yahweh, and they did not maintain the faith of Yahweh, this was required by the law of Moses, and so they did as was required. In this whole milieu, you need to think in terms of the remnant concept. We've run into this term remnant several times in the book of Ezra, and we will run into it again uh, when we read books like Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi. The word remnant is very prominent there. A remnant is the piece that's left over, and this idea begins all the way back in the time of the patriarchs, and even the time of Moses. When you go back to the time of patriarchs, of course, uh, you'll notice that in the families of Abraham and Isaac, there were uh, distinguish, uh, distinguishing um, uh, choices made between the different children. In the family of Abraham, the son of promise was Isaac, but it was not Ishmael, nor was it the sons of Keturah, the third wife that Abraham had by whom he had six sons. And when you come to the family of Isaac and Rebekah, it is Jacob who was chosen and not Esau. And then finally, when you have Jacob's children, Jacob has 12 sons. But out of Jacob's 12 sons, the promises of the land of Canaan were given to all of these sons as a whole. And all 12 of the sons of Jacob became tribes or clans within the nation of Israel. Those clans, of course, ended up in Egypt as slaves, as we uh, know from the book of Exodus. But when they came out of, out of Egypt in the Exodus and they went into the wilderness, you'll remember that when they came to Kadesh and they were first supposed to go into the land of promise, that these people rebelled. And in fact, there was a sentence passed on them because of their rebellion. All of those who rebelled would die in the desert. 
and only the second generation will be allowed to inherit the promised land of Canaan. This means that the second generation would be the remnant, and the first generation was destroyed. So the second generation becomes the remnant of those who were left over and become heirs of the promise. This second generation goes into the land of Canaan. But as you continue on in the history of Israel, the monarchy divides into two nations. And so there are ten clans in the north and two clans in the south. The ten clans in the north are exiled by Assyria. And for all practical purposes, they disappear into the Assyrian hegemony. Judah, then, becomes the remnant who is allowed to last for another 150 years or so in the south. And yet Judah also was taken exile by the Babylonians to Babylon. And Judah, which was the remnant, is now a remnant in exile. And then it is out of exile that the remnant is allowed to come back by the decree of Cyrus of Persia. And so the exiles return to the city of Jerusalem and to the area of Judea so that they become the remnant. And so this term remnant is used over and over again. As you come to the prayer of Ezra, which he prays on behalf of the people, he prays out of that concept of the remnant. And that's such an important idea. Ezra says, if we continue to intermarry with the people that are not worshipers of Yahweh, would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving no remnant, no survivor? The threat, of course, was that the people of Israel would simply become extinct. And all of the promises of God for the future would thereby become extinct with them. So this revival of Ezra, this returning to the covenant by Ezra was extremely important. And in doing so, he becomes the primary figure who preserves the remnant and brings them back to faith in Yahweh and to keeping covenant. This then ends lecture number nine.